and welcome to the Scotta Chronicast, the podcast which discusses all things relating to medieval Scotland. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. I want to welcome you to the very first Halloween special episode of the Scotta Chronicast. And today we have with us Dr. Lizzie Swarbrick and Dr. Callum Watson. Hello. Hi there. So today is going to be potentially a little bit of a silly episode, um, but it's Halloween and we're having fun. So I am going to start out with a strange story um, of <laughs> one that I find kind of silly of supernatural origins of a castle. It's a castle you might have heard of. It's Cawdor Castle. So famous from Shakespeare's Macbeth. It gets mentioned um, <laughs> and the the origins of how this castle was supposedly built, I find, or there's a story about um, <laughs> where the location was identified for building it, which I find very entertaining. In, in kind of a Shakespearean manner, apparently, upon being given permission to fortify at Cawdor, the Thane of Cawdor had a dream, as one does. A dream that instructed him how to find the best location to build his castle. And in this dream, he was instructed to load up a donkey with a chest of gold. And he was supposed to let the donkey wander, wander his property, <laughs> but not lose sight of it. Like he was supposed to stalk the donkey and kind of, you know, make sure that he kept track of it. And wherever the donkey finally decided to lie down and rest, that was the location that he was supposed to build his his castle. Uh -huh. So apparently, I mean, so the story goes anyway, he did this. <laughs> he loaded up a donkey with gold and watched it wander his land for like most of a day. I don't know how we know if it was most of a day or not, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're sounding very convinced by, by all of this. <laughs> okay, so I am half convinced by it, and I'll, I'll tell you why later. <laughs> so the donkey wanders the property and lies down underneath this tree. And then he built his, his tower, his castle around this this tree. And Nigel Tranter talks about how there was a whole tree, like in the, the vaulted basement and like parts of the tree up, although dead by this point, in like the, the ground floor. And I'm not, I don't know about how <laughs> accurate that part of it is, <laughs> but there is apparently a preserved stem of a holly tree um, that has been carbon or carbon dated to 1372 that is mm. in the vaults Ooh. of the tower at Cotter Castle. <laughs> and I find that like fascinating because most of these stories you're just kind of like, eh, that's a story. It's fun, but it's just a story. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like there is actually a tree in the vault that this tower has been built around. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know if either of you have, I mean, it's, it's there on the historic environment. <laughs> like website it's it's Ooh. all there um i would of course love to know more about this but <laughs> i just maybe they're like huh there's a live tree down here what's a cool story to go around it like chicken and egg kind of situation yeah yeah what what is the oldest tree we can find in these parts <laughs> yeah but also i've never heard of any other like structures being like built around live trees, at least in a yeah. from a medieval context. I don't know if either of you have. Do you know when the story comes from? Like, when is it first recorded? I don't. I wasn't able to find that information about when the story came about. No, fair enough. I just, it reminds me of things in, like, classical literature about uh, Odysseus's palace is built around a, a great tree which forms the forms the marital oh, bed for true. him and Penelope. I wonder if somebody's trying to give it a sort of romantic like semi-mythical mm. semi-mythical history because that's always fun to do yeah definitely um no i was even trying to figure out when the original because i first heard about it and nigel tranter has this book tales and traditions of scottish castles which is mostly just well, stories similar to this about random yeah. castles and none of it is like it's not one of his proper scholarship books and that he doesn't mm -hmm. cite anything mm. so um <laughs> 
I was trying to find out more information about it. Um, Yeah, like how old this story is. And it's just one of those, it's like, you know, tradition has it that this is what it is. And I had hoped to get more information on like, was this story kicking around in the 15th century or the 14th century? Or was it just, yeah, created Victorian era? Mm. (laughs) But yeah, I don't know. But I find it. The thing I find a bit strange about the story <laughs> is that um, why would a donkey choose under a holly bush to like have a rest? Surely that's going to be prickly. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, maybe it was pruned, like <laughs> the branches had been pruned up. I don't know. Donkeys, <laughs> don't they like eat everything? Well, that's actually, you point that out. Nigel Tranter says it's a hawthorn tree, oh, okay. but the actual mm. like, carbon dating description is a holly tree. So I don't know. That, that is interesting. I have, I have a, a pal who, um, who, who did a PhD, just should have graduated just in the last sort of month or so, who was looking at trees in uh, medieval literature and, and had thought quite a bit about things like the possible symbolism of, of mm. trees changing breed depending on you know when oh. and where certain stories were um were written you know things wow. like a, a tree being say some night rests under being a an oak tree in one romance and then a hundred years later on the other side of the english channel somebody repeating the story but suddenly it's a, a hawthorn tree or a, a holly bush or something like that oh, interesting um, not <laughs> not not that i know what the significance of that <laughs> right is but right but there's potentially one yeah, yeah well i in tranter's description it sounds like he was physically there and saw this massive tree <laughs> in the vault yeah. <laughs> But from the the historic environment Scotland record, it just is like a stem. (laughs) So I don't know. I don't know if there used to be more and it got removed or yeah, there's there's a lot more, I'm sure, to that tale. Um, (laughs) Maybe to be uncovered later. But yeah, that's that's cool. I was trying to remember if there was any particular significance to the meaning of a holly tree and like from from fairy tales or anything. Mm. It's I mean, other than it being one of the ones that's used a lot in Christmas or that kind of folklore because it's a a green, evergreen kind of tree. Mm. So it's it's one of those. Yeah. And also it's thorns and the, the red berries of Christ's blood and things like that. Yeah. Um, so there might be some, I don't know, some, I'm sure you could read in some <laughs> semblance of there of, of that. But for now, I just find it entertaining that this guy was like, hey, I dreamed these really random instructions for how to, where to build my castle. And I followed them, apparently. <laughs> anyway, that's my supernatural yeah. story for the day. I love it. <laughs> Right, so um, my story is from, uh, I can only date it as far back as the the mid-17th century, but um, it's one of those sort of weird compendiums of of family histories that are written around that time, which allege that these stories have come down in family documents from blah, 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 blah. Um, So who knows? It could be absolutely (laughs) real. But so we're we're sort of around. Um, I think it's eleven seventy four. So is that William the Lion? Um, I think, and the the writer of this story introduces it by saying that he's really upset that this fantastic story hasn't made it into any of the any of the histories of this time, any of the official official works. Um, they say they always <laughs> leave out the very principal and grand occurrences, leaving us just with bare lists of kings and their times of rain so I didn't really expect to get my historiography from a a 16th century noble uh, sorry 17th century nobleman but there you go um so it is quite a good story I think um (laughs) so it begins with a young man a young member of the court uh John Somerville who is a, a, a lovely youth he's 15 years old he's the king's falconer you know he's doing great but Meanwhile, in the parish of Linton, so that's just just near Kelso in the in the Scottish borders, he says there happened to breed an hideous, mm-hmm. 
hideous monster in the form of a worm. Um, so this is our our dragon. I have to say that the mm. description after that doesn't sound so threatening because he says that it's uh, three spots <laughs> yards in length. I mean, that is quite big. That's like two and a half meters. If I saw a snake of two and a half meters, I would be quite scared. Mm. Um, but then he also says that it's just about bigger than a man's leg, yeah. which doesn't sound quite so frightening. Oh. So, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so it's two and a half meters long. It's a bit wider than a man's leg. Oh, and it's got a really big face. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, otherwise, apparently, it looks like, a, looks like a common adder. So this is clearly some sort of freakish overgrown snake. Um, and... Um, <laughs> A little bit like in the in the Lampton Worm, which is a story I know when I was um, I grew up in in County Durham when I was really little, and always grown up with the story of the Lampton Worm. So I'm really pleased to read about the Linton Worm. Um, and the Linton Worm is quite similar. It it, uh, it creeps so, around. No, I was I was going to say same come and come from the northeast. The Lampton Worm was a a big part of my. Uh... My childhood. I, I I I won't do it here, but I I can actually recite Lampton Worm poem oh, um, that that does the rounds. <laughs> I only know the chorus now. They're like, Wish lads, had you got yeah yeah. I'll I'll tell you all an awful story. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I didn't want to attempt it because now I've got a southern accent, so I couldn't get away with it. But thanks for that. <laughs> um. So this Linton Worm is uh, it sort of lies around in a low piece of ground near Linton Church, which we're told to this day is called Worms Glen. And it uh, it gets its victims by creeping. <laughs> it's really slow. So it has to creep amongst uh, bent heather and grass, <laughs> the source says. And it sneaks up on, on farms mm. and on beasts and then swallows the cows, munches them right up before the farmer knows what's happening. Um, so <laughs> obviously everybody is really freaked out by this man's leg-sized snake um, who's eating all of the cows. <laughs> And so people try to kill it. Obviously, they've got arrows. They try and shoot it with darts. I'm not quite sure whether that works. But anyway, apparently they managed to hurt it a bit, but nobody managed to really get it because uh, the skin is too impenetrable. And there starts to be a sense that the monster was sent as a judgment on um, on the Scottish borders for their sins it's making mm. such a kerfuffle in the lands around Kelso that the people <laughs> run away from it, which is fair enough. But then again, like we have our our author, this 17th century nobleman, who really is not down with folklore, obviously, because he's he talks about how the country people who who flee from it begin to tell loads of lies, so that it gets bigger and bigger every day. Um, apparently it gets wings. People say that they've seen it in the night. <laughs> so it becomes some kind of nocturnal freak. Um, people say that it's um, full of fire and that then also it can breathe fire. And, yeah, the, the author talks about all of this and says, um, these with a thousand other ridiculous stories which the timorous multitude are ready to invent on such an occasion. Love that all of these people are just waiting for a big worm. <laughs> and it's like, well, I've seen that guy. He's got absolutely got fire in his belly and he toasted my friend the other day. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, re-enter the lovely John Somerville, who on his wanderings around um, southern Scotland, hears about this fantastic creature. And so goes up to see what's going on. And he looks for the creature for quite a while and finally finds it. And the creature apparently just looks at him really fiercely with its mouth open, whereupon, and I quote, he concludes this creature was not so dangerous as the report went. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, this is great. This is really, I'm really feeling the, the pressure here. Um Nonetheless, he's like, well, I'll kill it for you guys. Um, because, I mean, I mean, he's there anyway, isn't he? And he notices, um, he, he thinks that he can't probably get close enough to stab it in the side because its skin is too strong. But he notices that whenever mm. it sees him, it opens its mouth and stares at him really fiercely. 
So he's got a plan. Then there's a bit of a sort of training montage in the in the source where he makes himself an extra strong big lance and he attaches a burning piece of peat onto the end of it and then practices a lot with his horse so his horse doesn't get wheezy with the smoke. He seems like quite a, you know, quite a conscientious lord here. And then the fateful day comes. It's not some sort of preordained day. Like often in in medieval legends, these things happen on a on a saint's day or, or something like that. But no, he just says, apparently this is, um, he chose the day and he wrote around the country uh, inviting spectators to come and have a look at him. <laughs> so he's seen a, a worm. It's a, the size of a man's leg. He's decided it's not that impressive, but he'll kill it anyway. And he invites all of his mates to come and watch him. <laughs> um, Does he succeed? Oh, my gosh. What do you think, Kate? Can you imagine? No, he fails. And no, no, I'm joking. And um, he <laughs> he makes a, a little like catering <laughs> wheel on the end of his lance and puts resin and pitch and um, brimstone on it and lights it. And then charges at oh. the at the at the serpent at the worm this dragon like as if he's sort of <laughs> going to joust it and he pokes it full in the mouth while it's staring at him, um, and the the lance breaks <sighs> off and this horrible dragon creature swallows this burning tip of his lance and in her death throes manages to stir the country up around there so. In a way, it's a it's an origin legend for um, I think it's an Iron Age hill fort there, um, and other hills nearby in otherwise what's quite a sort of flat oh. valley. Um, but yeah, it creates this hill around itself during its death throes. Interesting. This is all a, a, a all a seventeenth century narrative, as I've said. But we do have one piece of medieval evidence, which is a, a relief carving. Uh, which is set into Linton Church. And it's now, um, the church has been been renewed, I think, in the 19th century, if I remember right. But there's this, there's this medieval relief um, of an, a knight um, on horseback mm-hmm. um, about to, to stab a creature in the face. Um, slightly unfortunately for the legend, the creature <laughs> seems to be either a bear or a dog, but um, maybe that's just one of the religions. Uh, Maybe that's just one of the crazy villagers' tales after all. Um, but there you go. So that's Worms Glen and the Linton Worm. Um, and <laughs> yeah, a slightly underwhelming Scottish medieval dragon story. <laughs> <laughs> I love how practical the like description is. It's like, uh, you know, it's not actually that big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a story that just kind of undercuts itself right at this sort of dramatic... Yeah, every single point. Oh man, that's wonderful. I love it. And you know, maybe it was a shapeshifter as well, and that's why it shifted into a bear or a wolf or Yeah. Yeah. I mean was was the dog as wide as a man's leg in the in the relief? (laughs) I'll go back and take measurements. <laughs> oh, I love those sorts of descriptive measurements. Like it's wide as a man's leg. <laughs> it's like, eh, you know, depending on the man, that could be, you know, a lot bigger uh, or a lot smaller. Like, <laughs> yeah, if it's Chris Hoy's legs, then you know that's truly, truly frightening. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, I love that story. That is amazing. Thank you no, you're <laughs> for welcome. sharing I that. I love the <laughs> uh, I love the idea that it's just this big snake. <laughs> and really slow as well. And it doesn't do anything. Like, it doesn't attack. Right, that's the thing, that it's like, it's a slow one. It's slow. It doesn't attack John <laughs> Somerville at any point. It just looks at him with a sort of, like, gawps at him with a big open mouth. <laughs> Shocked. <gasps> Look at this man. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actually really excited to see him. Yeah. Oh. Oh, hi, mate. So good to see you. <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I came across this story, though, while trying to do some like quite dull, like family tree research into somebody that had founded a church in the later Middle Ages. So I think also it's the, it was the kind of light relief of, of, pouring through endless <laughs> endless PDFs of huge 
family histories and then finding this really odd story about right kind of rubbish dragon i i'm glad that you found that and yeah it must have been quite a a good diversion from the yeah, rather absolutely. tediousness that family trees can be sometimes callum what's your ghost story then yeah yeah well i feel a little bit bad because mine mine isn't uh, the origin story of anything yeah. <laughs> so it, it doesn't explain any geographical features at all um, it's just this weird, weird thing. It, I want to hear about so it. So my, my story comes from the Wallace, which, as I'm, I'm sure you both know and a lot of the listeners will know, um, is a, a long narrative poem purporting to um, recount the life and times of William Wallace, mm-hmm. written in probably in the 1470s, um, and famously not a massively accurate account of, of what it claims to be an account of, largely because it's filled full of stories like, like this one, <laughs> um, and ri- written by a writer who's kind of almost a ghost in himself. Um, Blind Harry is is the name that historians ascribe to the to the author of the Wallace book. I mean, we know virtually nothing about him. He leaves <laughs> very little uh, trace of himself behind beyond this this one poem. And that name, actually, uh, Blind Harry, has a sort of Halloween-y feel to it already because it, it mm-hmm. is almost certainly a, either a pseudonym or a, a you know a, a nickname that he is. You know, he, he may very well have been blind. He may very well have been called Harry. But Blind Harry, that phrase is a, a, a phrase that's used to describe the devil in um, in Scott's literary culture. So it's, it, yeah. it, it is almost certainly a, a sort of, as I say, either a, a, a pseudonym for you know, to to mask his identity to his audience, um, uh-huh. but more likely it's a a, a, a sort of stage name. Um, there is a reference to a, a blind Harry being paid by James the Fourth on several occasions at Linlithgow for the you know the recitation of poems and songs and so forth. So it's it's probably yeah. his kind of stage name, as it were, but a, a reference to to Satan to the devil. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, the story itself it involves Wallace as usual, has been in a fight with the English. He and his, his sort of small band of followers. Um, and as Wallace and his men flee through the woods, trying to get away from the English, one of them, a guy called uh, Fowden, uh, is falling behind. And Fowden is a, a character who's appeared on a couple of occasions in the in the story, or in the poem, rather, previous to this, and has been a kind of dull melancholic miserable sort of figure you know a a, a regular supporter of wallace but a a guy who uh harry has has been at pains to to emphasize is not really sort of one of the boys and the Mm. suspicion that harry shares with us is that maybe he's on the english side maybe he's in the english pay and he's Mm -hmm. kind of dragging his feet Mm -hmm. to slow wallace down and, and make sure that the english get him ah. and so <laughs> wallace has this moment of calculation how, how he talks us through what what goes through wallace's mind at this point and it's it really <laughs> weird or I, I i think it's really weird it's very cynical <laughs> wallace harry tells us things well look either fountain is is trying to slow us down and he's a traitor in which case you know i should just get rid of him mm. or He's actually just genuinely slow, and sooner or later he's going to get captured by the English and get turned. And then one of these days, I'm, you know, he's going to appear in a, an English force that I'm going to have to fight. So I'm pretty much going to have to kill him anyway. And so Wallace just chops <laughs> off his head, and Wallace and the guys just run for it and, and escape <laughs> from the English. And I, I think we're supposed to sympathise with Wallace in that, you know, in, in that sequence. Like I get the impression that Harry thinks. That he's kind of justifying uh, Wallace's act here, but it is it is hard, I think, as a modern reader, <laughs> to be totally on board with that justification and that explanation as to like why this was kind of an okay thing for uh, <laughs> for, for Wallace to do. Um, but any anyway, uh, Wallace and the guys they get to uh, Gath Hall, which is a real place. Um, it's it's near Octorada, I believe, <laughs> um, and. Uh, so they, they're hiding out in, in gas coal and it, it gets to the night time and they're all gathered around the fire and outside they hear these rude horns, um, this really loud horn blowing outside. Um, and Wallace, 
says to two of the guys, off you go, go and find out what that's all about. And of course, those guys don't come back. And so mm-hmm. Wallace sends two more guys and those guys don't come back. And, <laughs> you know, like the stupidest person in a horror movie, Wallace keeps <laughs> sending guys off in twos <laughs> and they just disappear. And eventually Wallace is sitting there all by himself and the horns are still going, you know, louder than they were at, at the start. And so <laughs> Wallace draws his sword and off he goes to investigate what's going on. And he gets to the door, throws open the door, and outside is standing the headless corpse of Fowden with the head still held in its hand. <laughs> the corpse proceeds to throw the head at Wallace, who, with remarkable presence of mind, actually catches it and throws it back <laughs> at the corpse, which I, I, I like, I, I can't help but find quite impressive. <laughs> Wallace then you'd have to have quite good, yeah, quite good reflexes to be able to catch your own head when you can't see because you've got no head on. Yeah, right. Like I, I would definitely <laughs> not have either the reflexes or the sort of presence of thought <laughs> to to do that in the same situation. Very early morbid game of basketball. Yeah, yeah. He's lucky that. You know, Foden doesn't throw it straight back to him and to think it's a game, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe that was the point. Maybe it's like the uh, the dragon. It was just, it was trying to be friends and just <laughs> gets misread. <laughs> um, but w- Wallace then flees up the stairs um, and jumps 15 feet, uh, Harry says, out of a window, uh, back down to ground level. Um, and and flees away across the the countryside outside Gas Hall, turning back only to see Gas Hall in flames, and he thinks he sees um, the the sort of silhouette of Fowden's headless corpse carrying a, a burning rafter. And Wallace <laughs> flees off into the countryside. We get a, a short passage where Harry kind of says. That was pretty weird, wasn't it, kids? You know, <laughs> devil moves in mysterious ways. This was clearly something um, occult and, and evil and demonic. And then Wallace runs into a bunch of folks that he's met before and just joins up with them and off they go and carry on their adventures. And it's never mentioned again. <laughs> There's no kind of real explanation given. Harry doesn't go out of his way to kind of moralize about what's gone on. He just reports it like it was a, a, a bold, up, kind of straightforward fact, and then just moves on with the narrative, and it, it, everything's fine again. <laughs> <laughs> what about all those people that went missing? <laughs> yeah. No, they just, I mean, I, so ha- Harry mentions that, you know, Wallace is upset to have lost those guys, but, you know, you and, know. and goes looking for, like, the remainder of his friends, meets a bunch of folks that he's had contact with before and then just forget it forgets about them just that's it <laughs> it's like wallace who, you were a terrible friend yeah even, even harry in his, in his little sort of summary at the end says you know that he he can't say what happened to them like he doesn't know if they were taken by some unearthly power or killed or swept off to hell like even he doesn't offer a kind of a specific explanation as to, to what happened to them. They're just, they just, they just exist as kind of set dressing. You know, they're, they're, they're like, you know, when you watch a horror movie, you can always tell there's some characters that are in there that are just there to like die in a really grisly, <laughs> yeah. like horror Red movie tricks. special effect way. That's, that's those guys. Bless them. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastically weird story to just be thrown in the middle of the wall. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I'm not saying he deserved it, because obviously losing several men is really harsh, but, like, you do feel like some retribution, probably, he had coming to him. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like yes. that's the thing. Like, there is there is definitely a modern retelling of that story where Wallace is the bad guy, and, yeah. and we're actually sympathising with the headless dogs. <laughs> 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 well, I have, I have two questions regarding that. How... How is a headless corpse blowing a horn? <laughs> I mean, I know it's all super dead. Like, how is he wandering around anyway? But like, <laughs> and also, what is he doing with the burning rafter? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> what and why is he just like wandering around with a burning raptor? But, I mean, there, <laughs> there's, there's, there's like a lot going on <laughs> in this story in, in terms of like the, the basic practicality stuff. Like it's, I mean, it, it covers, I think maybe I've, I've got it next to me. I mean, it covers maybe about, um, 60 lines from getting to gas call to the end of, um, of that sort of reflection, Harry's reflection. That takes you from about, mm-hmm. um, book, <laughs> for, for anyone who wants to actually go and read the thing, um, book five, line 180 to about two, well, maybe 245, maybe. Um, so what's that? 60 odd pages, uh, 60 odd lines rather. Not yeah. even that, I think. But I mean, it's packed full of <laughs> yeah. nonsense. <laughs> you know, it's not like they get they get a lot good. <laughs> Unexplained supernatural events. <laughs> yeah. No, no wonder even Harry, who let's face it, might actually have just been making the story up himself. At the end, he goes like, "I can find no explanation for this whatsoever. I, 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 there's no message here at all, kids. Carry on." <laughs> just like. It's just like this random, like, you know what? I'm going to tell a really weird, creepy story. Yeah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> just carry on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of, one of the things that, that is often sort of thought, it, it's a very episodic kind of a, a poem, as is the Bruce. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, you know, a lot of the of, of the material in the Wallace doesn't appear anywhere previously despite the fact that obviously it's been written, you know, 150 years after Wallace's hmm. death. And mm-hmm. it's, it is, it, despite that fact, a, a lot of it is kind of tied to real places. There's a kind of arc from sort of Asia up through um, kind of uh, West Lothian, Eastern Perthshire and Western Fife, um, even up into sort of uh, Angus, where, a lot of the action takes place and, you know, a lot of events mm-hmm. happen, you know, like Gas Hall in Perthshire, a lot, a lot of them are tied to specific mm. geographical uh, locations. And it's been suggested, I think, quite reasonably that Harry is drawing a lot on mm. folklore and, you know, on sort of local traditions about, you know, Harry has maybe visited some of these places and being told, oh, yeah, you know, Wallace, he, he once hit up that tree to escape from some Englishman or, you know, he <laughs> lived in that cave for a week or whatever. Um, why on earth the, the local people in Gascolo would be telling <laughs> this story about, oh, yeah, you think it's you think it's weird that Wallace was once tied to that tree over there? Well, we, when he came and visited <laughs> us, he, he had a, a ball tossing competition <laughs> with a headless corpse. <laughs> <laughs> who then burned down the local manor house. Like, what's what's going on in Gas Hall in the late 15th century where, like, that's that's their local tradition about William yeah, Wallace? They're just really bored. <laughs> they're like, oh, come on. So maybe they're just trying to invent something really top about their place. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to get it on the map, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or they're trying to claim get some some sort of damages owed them for. Oh, good idea. The building having yeah. been burned. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a, a very inventive insurance claim. <laughs> How did the property burn down? Well, let me let me tell you. <laughs> You're never gonna believe this. But. Have you ever had your manor yeah. house burnt down by a ghost and it wasn't your fault? You may be entitled to compensation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see it illustrated. The yes. whole story, I feel like, is crying out for a graphic novel. Yeah. In it, when, you know, when you, again, when you think about all of the sort of popular media that, you know, William Wallace and Robert the Bruce have appeared in, and it's it's always the same sort of half a dozen stories of, you know, his grisly death or, you know, him, him being betrayed and captured and all that stuff. And you just think, you know, something like this would look yeah. great on film. You know, why, yeah. why are we painting our on-screen William Wallace's blue when we could be having them <laughs> facing um, right. ghosts and wrestling lions? Yeah. 
<laughs> Any listeners out there looking for something fresh for, for a screenplay, <laughs> get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> I do think historical epics should have more sort of moments of light relief. Like I think a sort of, you know, like you could just have a kind of cute cute musical number where William Wallace plays catch with a headless ghost. Like, I mean, who wouldn't want to see that? But your popcorn in front of you (laughs) would be beautiful. I know that would be that would be (laughs) the best. I (laughs) figure out a way to make it happen. (laughs) Uh, I've loved this. This has been super awesome. I have enjoyed all of these stories. (laughs) They are great. This is what makes history Mm -hmm. wonderful. Like the weird, the weird elements of it. (laughs) Do you want to hear my weird backup story very quickly? Yes. Um, So it's a speedy one. Um, I'm super intrigued. It's so it's St. Waldeff, who's um, uh, was at Melrose Abbey. And it isn't really a proper saint, but it was locally a saint for quite a long time. So there's mass going on in the abbey. And Mm -hmm. just at the point where, um, so it's just before communion, um, the priest is saying the the Agnus Dei and holding aloft the chalice and a spider drops into it. And you're not allowed to do anything else when you're performing the liturgy apart from the prescribed (laughs) movements and words. So he sort of starts coughing and sort of you can imagine him like desperately trying to point with his eyes to show everyone that a big spider's fallen inside the chalice, um, along with the blood of Christ, of course. Um, and they don't know what to do. And Waldeff is like, I've got this, guys, makes a, a little prayer and then encourage, encourages the celebrant to just down the, the, the chalice of wine. The celebrant is like, yeah, all right, I can do this. And because it's a lovely miracle, of course. He uh, drinks it and he doesn't feel sick at all. Uh, but then later on, they're having, um, they're in the refectory having their evening meal. And the celebrant starts to feel that he's got a bit of an itchy finger. So he scratches the itch and his finger swells up and swells up and swells up. And then a giant spider bursts out of it. Um, and all of the monks uh, torch it. So that it oh, bursts, wow. uh, bursts into flame. And then they all carry on having their dinner. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good miracle, right? I that is very entertaining. I yeah yeah. As far as miracles go, that's a little bit you know <laughs> g- going for different. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was definitely not expecting no. that ending. I was no, I was all ready for a kind it's... of medieval Spider Man that like the spider comes out and it, oh, it, you wow. know it's it, it, uh, as a result of having been you know part of that ceremony it now it goes off and like converts heathens <laughs> right <laughs> I don't, yeah. obviously have a much more opti- optimistic view than the writer <laughs> of that that story oh Kate somebody's going to have to give you some money for screenplays yes. here what with the ghost William Wallace and then. Um... And then the idea of like a saintly medieval Scottish Spider Man. I mean, you you're really someone's going to be giving you those royalty checks. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is yeah. Yeah. this is yeah. gold yeah. here. You heard it first on the Scottish Chronicle. Well, I was thinking. I know the timing is not um, <laughs> obviously correct, but it was like, oh, and this is the spider that then went and hid Bruce oh, in the yeah. cave. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you could easily tie yes, all this stuff can. together. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I much prefer the the idea of the spider going <laughs> around and converting <laughs> converting heathens. Just becomes yeah. a missionary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, just thought I'd throw that one in. I like that one a lot as well. Yeah. That one's amazing. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I'm like. <laughs> Thinking of like the spider now has healing properties, and he goes around and like <laughs> bites the sick, bites the lepers to heal them. Like <laughs> Spider Man, Charlotte's Web, but in middle, medieval yeah. Scotland. We can do this. We could make so it many happen. possibilities. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. This has been a very fun episode. I've enjoyed these (laughs) stories. Thank you for having me, Kate. It's been a a pleasure. I hope you have a very happy Halloween. And you too, Callum. Yeah, same same to you both. Happy Halloween. It it has. It's been a a joy to hear some um, 
quite spooky, ranging to quite odd <laughs> historical <laughs> Scottish tales. <laughs> Yes, slightly touching on the supernatural. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's been super fun. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. The Scotta Chronicast is just one of many things relating to medieval history on medievalists.net. If you like what you see and what you hear, consider being a patron on patreon.com slash medievalists. Thank you for joining us on the Scotta Chronicast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow our account on Twitter, at Scottachronicast. Our music is Ex to Lux Oratur by Gaeta. Thanks for listening. Bye.